fixing this issue is great. Wow, it's even better than I was thinking of. Okay, perfect. And it looks like we're already going to Facebook Live. Hello, everybody who's joining us from Facebook side and welcome to everybody joining us on the Zoom side of things. So, all right. Welcome, Linda. Looks like we have a, a, a few master gardeners amongst us tonight, which is great. Kathy, I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, mute myself, but for everybody on Facebook, I will be shooting your questions to Kathy. And Kathy, do you have your device there just in case? Oh, perfect, wonderful, mm -hmm. okay. Ideal because I have three kiddos in the house tonight. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And if you need to, you can unmute yourself and ask verbally too, uh, if you get a chance to do that. Uh, well, that I'll, I'll be right you. here. And if you don't mind, should I go ahead and hit record? Yep. Go ahead and start. And we still have a couple minutes till seven. So we'll still let a few more people in. But while they're coming in, um we're encouraging people to put in the chat maybe who they are or where they garden at maybe if there's a specific pollinator question they have or native perennial question they might have um let's see i already have something in the q and a okay is star bethlehem good for pollinators or is an invasive weed um so i am going to say some bees do visit it um, it's not the greatest on the list of pollinator nectar plants, um, and it can be a bit invasive. So I would say if you were to pick between things, you wouldn't pick that as one of the bulbs you would add to your garden. If you've inherited a bunch of Star of Bethlehem popping up in your lawn and garden, then you might start to thin it out after a while. I would replace it with um, Kamasia which is a native bulb. Um, and there's a dwarf version and a tall version of the Kamasia. And Kathy, can you spell that for me and I'll make a note? Sure. In and it's, I'm not sure if it's two M's, but it's C-A-M, might be M-M-A-S-S-I-A. -S -S so Kamasia. Um, and that's one of our few uh, native bulbs that you can buy as a bulb. Um, so a lot of ours, uh, native plants don't come in bulb form, but that's one of the, one of the few that you can you can order from bulb catalogs or buy at Homestead in the bulb department when they have the fall blooming bulb dis the fall <laughs> display of spring blooming bulbs I should say, and then also now of course we have the beautiful summer blooming bulb season coming up. Okay, so I'm gonna um, put that one as answered. Okay. All right, so I think we're just at seven now. So we'll go ahead and get started since we have a ton to cover in a brief hour and we're gonna go off like a shot and great, Serena spelled it. Uh, I will double check on my spelling in a minute. <laughs> but that's that's what I'm picturing in my head as a spelling. And hello from Waldorf, Maryland, yay. Um, so we're talking now specifically about plants for pollinators that are also Maryland native perennials. And I put in parentheses there a few trees. And here comes one perennial guest. This is Santino who wants to say hi to everybody. So <laughs> he is my garden kitty. He's a Maine Coon, so he's a very big boy, as you see. Um, so he'll probably settle in and, and watch the talk too. So I guess I should very briefly introduce myself. I'm Kathy Gents. I'm editor and publisher of Washington Gardener Magazine. We cover DC, Maryland, Virginia, and the mid-Atlantic area around it. Um, so Delaware, a bit of West Virginia, a bit of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and down all the way through Virginia and to a tiny bit of North Carolina as well. Um, so basically zone six through eight is our um, coverage zone for readership. And I'll hold up one of our back print issues. This was our shade theme issue. Um, we're now a digital publication and sent monthly to your email inbox as a PDF attachment. And we come out every month, uh, mid month, like around the 15th to 17th of the month. Um, and that's if you subscribe. So I'll give you some information at the end for how to contact me and how to subscribe and how to follow our social media. And I want to welcome you to the talk today and thank uh, Homestead Gardens 
for sponsoring this and for being such a cheerleader of native plants. So Homestead is ahead of the curve, in my opinion, uh, amongst independent garden centers with their embracing of native plants and chemical free gardening. So that's really great. All right, let's dive into our list of 20 native plants for pollinators. But first we're gonna talk about defining what a native is. Um, so in Rick Dark and Doug Tallamy's book a few years ago, The Living Landscape, they came together and they came up with this definition of native. And their definition is a plant or animal that is evolved in a given place over a period of time, sufficient to develop a complex and essential relationship with the physical environment and other organisms in it, in the in an ecological community. So that's to say, they're not defining native by the time period. So they're not saying it had to be here before Columbus set foot on the Americas. He's not saying before the colonists were here. He's not saying before our Native Americans uh, brethren were here. He's saying it is the relationship in the ecological community that makes it a native, not how long it's been on this continent. So I thought that was a great broad definition of native and it's something that shows the intrinsic relationships of things and that one thing could be beneficial and not have been here you know, before the ice age <laughs> and could have been a later introduction, but still something that our native flora and fauna benefit from. All right, so we'll dive into a few things about native plants. So there are a little bit of controversy between straight native plants and native R's. So a native R is a cultivated native. Um, so native R's come about in a few different ways. They can be selected naturally in nature. So you could be walking along a stream valley and you see a ton of Virginia bluebells and one of them is just a little more blue than the others. Um, and as a human, you could pull that one that's just a little more blue and pair it again with one that's a little more blue that you found. And then generation after generation, make a super dark blue Virginia bluebell. So that would be human selection. But there's also naturally occurring selections because say um, there's a valley full of black eyed Susans and the deer come and they graze all the black eyed Susans, except for this one section that doesn't taste as good to them. And they leave that one alone. So that one succeeds and seeds itself year after year and becomes bigger and bigger meadow of those black eyed Susans because those are the ones that the deer don't eat. And so that's a natural selection occurs because it's more successful and propagates itself. So again, native ours aren't always human made. There can be natural ways. and um, when we do select native ours and breed them in the industry for our gardens, it's usually for a purpose. Say, I'll talk about Joe Pye weed in a little bit here, but Joe Pye weed normally in most people's gardens is a bit of a big plant. It can get eight to 12 feet high. Um, so over the years, there's been selections to get Joe Pye weed smaller and smaller, and then they have now little Joe is one of the native ours that's available. Still has a great flower on it, still great for pollinators, but it only gets say to three feet instead of eight to 12 feet. So it's more manageable and useful for the home gardener, um, unless you have a space that you can put something as big as a straight species. So what they're trying to do is just develop plants that would be appealing to the home gardener and used in the home garden while still having the same beneficial traits as a straight native species. And there's lots of testing and trialing for stability of these traits going on out there. And Mount Cuba up in um, Delaware is doing a great job uh, with trialing a lot of these selections and they're, they're, they're trialing the straight native species and all the native ours side by side by side. So you can go up there um, and check out some of those trials and also go on their website, mountcuba.org to compare. So say they, they did a few years ago, all the garden flocks, the tall garden flocks availability. And they also rated it by how many pollinators and insects visited that flower. So they were able to see that the straight native species attracted say a hundred bumblebees a day. And then 
five butterflies and five beetles or something like that. Whereas this particular cultivar, nativar, attracted 80 species a day or 80 bumblebees. So that's great to, information to have to make your selections and to pick some of the native ours or the straight species that you think would do best in your garden. And I just was giving an example here of the Echinacea hot papaya to show you one of the native ours that's gone a little bit way right <laughs> or way left either direction that you would uh, prefer. So instead of having that beautiful cone head, um, of seeds available to the birds and all the pollen available to the pollinators because it's fully petaled out here. There's really not much that a pollinator can access in, in this cone flower as opposed to a straight native species. So sometimes when they're breeding, uh, they're doing it for looks or for color and not having the pollinator in mind. So again, those, those trials that are going on and the tests going on will, will tell us how the different native ours interact with our pollinators. Okay, so that's just our side note there. And just a quick note also on right plant, right place. I know the master gardeners who have joined us know this principle very well, but no matter how great this native plant I show you is and how many pollinators it services, if you plant it in the wrong place in your garden, it's not gonna succeed. So if it's a pollinator plant, sorry, there's, some commotion in the background there. Pollinator plant that likes to sit in wet soil and be in full sun and you put it in dry uh, soil and shade, it's not gonna succeed. So you need to know what the environment that that native plant uh, prefers. And the very most important thing of course is the cold exposure, the planting zone that it's local uh, to our local cold hardiness. But also sometimes you need to know the heat and humidity. Can it take mid-Atlantic's heat and humidity, the heat of our summer, as well as our cold winters? Can it take sun exposure, afternoon beating down sun, or is it just morning sun? Does it like to have wet feet or well-draining soil? And then clay soil versus sandy soil. Where was it originally from? All right, so let's talk uh, one more um, theory before we jump, in, jump into our pollinators choices and that's keystone species. Again, a little bit controversial, but the theory is that one species of, um, could be a plant or it could be an animal, is the dominant keystone species for an environment. And when this species fails, all the other species around it fail. And for our mid-Atlantic forested areas, that keystone species are the oak trees. And they're in a lot of danger lately because of climate change and um, other environmental stressors. So we really need to look out, to our oak, out for our oak trees. And if there's one tree that you can fit in your landscape, consider an oak tree. It doesn't have to be the huge old Southern red oak. It could be some of the smaller varieties of oaks, uh, but still think about planting one to survive you and maybe uh, go on for your children's generation and your grandchildren's and, and their generation. All right, so, and I wanted to say really quickly, because we're gonna talk a lot about plants that provide nectar for pollinators. Let's think a little bit about the pre-pollinators. So this is the larval stage or caterpillar stage of our pollinators and so, when we're thinking about pre-pollinators, we wanna add plants to our garden like poplar, willow, elm, and the oaks I just showed you. And we wanna give them lots of great herbaceous leaves to chew on and have, have all that strength built up in them so that they can build their chrysalis and pop open. So in your landscape, have a place that you let clovers and plantains and wild violets grow. And I was just Googling around for wild violets and see that the fritillary butterfly, there's 14, at least 14 native species of fritillary butterfly that rely on the wild violets for their larval food. So if you remove all the wild violets from your lawn and your garden, you're removing the larval food for those fritillary butterflies. So I know a lot of people don't like these um, mixed in, say with a lawn area, but consider putting a side area. Um, maybe it could be your median strip, could be an edging around another part of your garden that you leave alone and let clover take over or you let the wild violets take over that certain area. 
Okay, so now we're going to jump into the fun part, and I'm going to go season by season of what you can add to your garden to support pollinators. So our first um, blooming of the year for support, supporting pollinators is the early season nectar, and that's the phlox ground cover, also known as creeping phlox or carpet phlox, phlox stolonifera, and it provides early season nectar for swallowtail butterflies, sphinx moss and the hummingbirds. So hummingbirds come to the mid-Atlantic much earlier than people think. So they think once it's like May 1st or so in the last few days that they might start seeing hummingbirds, but they're actually coming um, much earlier up. So before you're getting your hummingbird feeders up, they're desperate for nectar. And so the phlox ground cover is a great choice. I like to have it on the edge of retaining walls spilling over because it likes great drainage. Um, and after the first flush of blooms, which we have on here now, dies back, you can shear it off, just take some hedge clippers and shear off those blooms that as they're dying back and you'll get a second smaller blooming um, so you can get a, a second one that'll be beneficial and hold on to for more pollinators after that. Once that second blooming dies back, then it's just a green moss, a great ground cover for the rest of the growing year. All right, so our next early season nectar, and I said we talk about mostly perennial plants, but we are going to include a couple trees that I love besides the oaks that we talked about earlier. So the eastern native redbud are pollinated by many types of native bees. Honeybees love them too, and several species of moth caterpillars and at least one species of butterfly caterpillar eat the redbud leaves. So if you see little bits of leaf chomping on there, that's a good thing. That means the larvae of these butterflies are getting their nourishment to turn into butterflies. And the other pollinator that loves red buds are the leaf cutter bees. So you'll see those beautiful heart shaped leaves on your red bud tree and you'll come out in the summertime and there'll be perfect circles cut out like somebody took a hole punch and cut them out of that. So that's the leaf cutter bee doing his work and it won't harm the tree, doesn't do anything, um, doesn't even look unsightly, kind of looks kind of cool when you have those holes in the leaves that are so perfectly symmetrical and spaced out. Um, so don't spray the trees, don't get excited. It's not a disease or anything that is totally natural that the larvae are um, feasting on those leaves. All right, so our next is um, spring nectar sources. Uh, so this is getting a little later into the springtime. We have our Ohio spiderwort and it's beneficial for the long tongue bees, especially bumblebees and surfid flies. I don't know if I spelled, I think I spelled surfid fly correctly. So it's one of those that blooms for a long season. You get a good I, you know, month to six weeks and then you can cut back the flower stalks and get a reblooming again. Um, so that's one of my favorites to use as an edging in the garden and for beneficial to pollinators. And the next one that I absolutely adore and I've been planting this one um, more and more in recent years is Zizia, also known as Golden Alexanders. This one has a long list of beneficial pollinators to it, um, from wasps and flies to beetles to short tongue bees. We talked about the long tongue bees for the um, uh, last slide, but it also is attractive to the long tongue bees and bumblebees and several types of butterflies. So this one um, is a paler yellow than some of the other darker yellow native plants that we see. Um, has a lighter, airier texture to the foliage. So it's a nice filler plant for your perennial border to, to pop in amongst things. All right, so next is Penstemon digitalis, the tall white beard tongue. Um, so guess what the name beard tongue came from? The long, native long tongue bees love to stick their little proboscis right there into the flower. And um, it's so fun also to see the bumblebees trying to steal the nectar from the side. They'll come from the side here and try to poke in and cut a hole in there as well. So it's fun to watch them do that. Um, Penstemon are getting a lot of attention in breeding now. So you'll have lots of selections available at Homestead Gardens. There's dark towers, there's burgundy versions, there's like a pinker flower, a darker foliage um, version as well. Um, it reseeds pretty readily in the garden spreads. It does like 
a bit of sun, but can take almost any soil type, even clay or sandy soil. So it's a good versatile plant for your pollinator garden. All right, so next um, we showed you prior to this, the hot papaya, the native R version, uh, one of the native R's of the echinacea. This is the straight species of the coneflower echinacea in my garden with a little butterfly having helping himself to some nectar. And this is one of the ones that if you could only pick, say, three plants to add to your pollinator garden, this would be at the top of the list, coneflower, because it does so well in different soils for us. It can go from part shade to part sun, but of course it prefers full sun for maximum flowering. Um, you can cut it back and it'll get a second bloom on it, uh, just like some of the other perennials. And it has a long list, of, as you see here, of pollinators that visit it. Um, and the great thing also is it has a side benefit of that seed head that you can let dry on there and then be beneficial to birds in the wintertime who will eat that, those seeds. So you say, you'll say, Kathy, you just told me to cut it back and let it rebloom again. So after the second blooming, then I leave those seed heads up. So I'll cut back the first blooming cycle, then let the second one come up. And then that's the, the set that I will leave to winter over for having seeds uh, for your um, bird friends. All right. So obviously in Maryland, we couldn't talk about native plants without talking about our black-eyed Susan rubecchia, the state flower. Um, so we have a lot of great visitors to the black-eyed Susan and similarly to coneflower, you can do a cutback after the first flowering flush and get a second smaller flowering flush and then leave those seed heads up for the birds. Um, you can also uh, easily dig and divide it and move it around your garden. I have found that I have Black Eyed Susans blooming in every spot in my garden except for absolute full shade. So as long as I get at least two hours of sunshine in a spot, my Black Eyed Susans will bloom there. So it's a great versatile native that doesn't mind clay soil, can take a bit of sandy soil as well, but also can go from part shade all the way to full sun and still bloom for you. So it's one of those plants that you can, can get, take a licking and keep on ticking as they say. It also can take a bit of salt spray and pollution from roads, nearby roads. So it's a good choice as well to put say on your median strip between your sidewalk and the road if you have one of those or to edge your sidewalks with. So if it gets a bit of salt spray um, from the winter, storm trucks passing by or a bit of spray from a neighbor salting their walks, uh, it'll keep going. It doesn't mind it too much. Doesn't love a lot of it, but it will keep on going. All right, so our next um, summer nectar source that we can use is the lance leaf coreopsis. Um, and this one is a great one for native bees and butterflies. So there is again, a lot of breeding done with coreopsis to get it to be small mini versions, to get ones with more flowers per plant. And um, I love to use it in the parts of your garden where things are really tough, like that bald spot out in the full sun where you can't get water to, maybe your hose doesn't reach that way, that's a place for coreopsis because it doesn't like extra moisture on it, likes good draining suns and likes beating down full afternoon sun. Um, it's also a great plant to start from seed. So if you could buy seed packs of coreopsis and scatter those um, in the fall, or you can do that in the spring and you can have annual coreopsis as well as perennial coreopsis in the mix. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Blazing Star. So I talked a bit about Camasia is one of the native bulbs that we can buy um, in the fall for spring blooming. Liatris is another one that we can purchase uh, just the corms or the root sections for and it'll be sold under bulbs and that's the blazing star so it's a tall long wand and that one is particularly loved by not just the native bees and butterflies but also the hummingbirds so it's one of the few purpley blue plants that's not the red or the straight orangey yellow that hummingbirds are usually attracted to. So it's a great one to have um, additionally in the garden to support hummingbirds. All right, so we have to, of course, talk about 
the many native milkweeds that we have available to us in the mid-Atlantic. This one, of course, is butterfly milkweed, uh, Sclepias tuberosa. Um, not just butterflies like milkweed. I find that, hum uh, I was going to say hummingbirds. Of course, hummingbirds do as well. I find actually that honeybees are what take over my milkweed, almost to the exclusion of butterflies. Like the bees kind of form a ball as soon as the, that, those tiny flowers open up. And it's a, also, of course, a larval food source for the monarch caterpillar. So not just a nectar source, but also a larval food source. So if you start to see something chewing on those leaves, that's a good sign. And maybe you can get out a little magnifying glass and come out a, a few days later after you see some chewing going on and see if you can find that little cat monarch caterpillar. And then once he forms a J shape, like an upside down J, that means he's ready to start to pupate and form his chrysalis around him. And you want to give him a space or her space and don't harass him at that point. You can just keep an eye on it and check every few days on the progress. Um, but it's, it's a cool thing to watch over the summertime. All right. So again, uh, another milkweed that does very well in our area. And this is the common milkweed, the one that forms a big ball at the top, a big pink ball. And that again, is supporting uh, the monarch butterflies as a larval food. And you see here a couple bees on it because they've gotten to it first because um, they are just in love with that. I find the common milkweed a little more challenging as a garden plant because what it does is it sends up a flower spike here and then it sends an underground runner and comes out three feet away and then another underground rudder and comes out four feet this direction. So it likes to run in different directions. So you're not gonna get a tight clump of just common milkweed together. It's gonna pop up in various spots in your garden. So you can dig and move it. Um, it doesn't love to be moved, but if it comes up in a spot that you don't want it to, of course you can pull that out and put that runner somewhere else. Whereas I'll go back to the previous slide, the butterfly milkweed, um, tends to stay where you plant it and expand in that clump there. So just a little precaution if you're surprised all of a sudden you come you go out to the garden one day and you're like I planted my milkweed here why is it eight feet over there that happens all the time <laughs> so don't be surprised. All right so I'm gonna take this mid-break for a question and I think we're really good on time and I saw a few things popping up. I think I'm going to do the Q&A first, and then I'll go to the chat, and then I'll check if we have any coming through from Facebook. Okay, so Robin says, I saw that milkweed and foxglove are not good for dogs. Do you have any pointers on keeping dogs safe and pollinators happy? Yeah, foxglove, digitalis, very much not good for dogs to chew on. That is poisonous. Milkweed, they would just get an upset stomach. There's latex inside. Um, that's what that milky sap and why milkweeds are named milkweeds is because when you break off a part of the stem, you get that um, latex coming out of it. And some people have an allergic reaction too if they get it on their skin and they have latex sensitivity. And of course, you don't want your dog to be chewing on it. Uh, the best thing, I guess, for dogs that like to chew on plants is to plant your milkweed or foxglove in a section of the garden that they somehow don't have access to that you can... Um, separate maybe with either some screening or something else or you can just put it out to the far edge of your property where your uh, canines aren't going to get to them and hopefully they just won't find it very tasty. <laughs> the Vox Globe, I would keep a special special eye on. You don't want them to chew on that. The milkweed, they would just get an upset stomach and hopefully not eat anymore after that. Uh, Ron says, I find that Triscantia will invade everywhere in my garden. Is this common? Ron, you're not wrong. <laughs> so there are some natives that love to proliferate. And like we said, with the common milkweed, milkweed popping up in different spots, the trade Scantia will reseed where they get a blank space and opportunity. And they really like to do that between pavers or like a gravel spot. So um, the way you can prevent that is to cut off the flower heads as they start forming the seed heads. Um, so you can grab it at the seed formation stage 
and snip those off and put that into your compost pile or out with your landscape waste or give those seeds to another gardener. But yeah, they'll pop up every once in a while um, throughout your garden. They'll start off in one spot and then you'll have a clump of few, a few other places and that's not uncommon. Um, that I usually just take advantage of and move those clumps to where I want them to. It's pretty shallow rooted. Um, it's not uh, as picky about being moved as milkweed is and might be sulky the first day or two after you transplant it, but will recover after a couple days after you transplant it. Okay, I think that's all for the Q&A board. So I'm gonna move on to the chat section and let's see, we had our greetings and Kamasha. Um, Julie says, when purchasing plants, how can you tell a cultivar from a state, straight species? Um, the biggest difference you'll find is on the plant tag, uh, it will have a name in single quotes. So it would be um, like I showed you earlier with the echinacea. So it would say echinacea hot papaya in single quotes. It will be a named cultivar. So otherwise, if it's a straight species, it would just say black eyed Susan Rudbeckia species. Um, you could bring your smartphone with you to the store. And if you have a name on a tag that you aren't sure of, you can always Google it to find that out as well. But in general, if it has a name in single quotes or it has a trademark or a registration mark, that is a native R or cultivated plant that's been registered and bred. Because um, obviously you can't trademark or uh, register a straight species, straight native species yet. I don't want to tempt the U.S. courts to do that, but <laughs> for now, nobody can register the straight species of the native plants. Okay, so we'll dive into um, blah, 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 blah. what are the best native plants for bayside homes? Okay, so I would say for bayside, of the ones we covered so far in the talk, the ones that put up with sandy soil a lot. The Blazing Star likes really well draining soils. Um, the Coreopsis is another great choice. It likes really well draining soils and full, full, full sun. So that would be great in that position. Uh, Black Eyed Susan, pretty adaptable. Same thing with Coneflower, pretty adaptable to different soils and stuff. Penstemon Digitalis, mm, I have it in some sandy soil. Um, it's pretty adaptable. I think that's one you could take a chance on for a bayside. Zizia aurea, that's more of a woodland plant. I wouldn't attempt zizia um, in sandy or um, bayside soils with full sun. That needs more like part sun and like leaf litter, leaf mold, composted type soils. Um, the Ohio spiderwort, mm, could it's that one's pretty adaptable so that could do as well redbud tree i wouldn't do just because that's a woodland edge tree and going back to the flocks uh you could do a little bit of the flocks ground cover but i would say go for some of these um more meadow like uh full sun native plants that we have here like black eyed susan and coneflower and the coreopsis and of course blazing star and in the second part of the talk when we're getting into fall and winter um, i'll try to point out some of those that that like more of the bayside um, straight sun and sandy soils okay i saw just a couple more new questions pop up uh, Kathy, will you talk about how different pollinators are attracted to different colors of blooms? Yes, yeah, so I talked a little bit about how hummingbirds, you know, especially have uh, sensitivity to red, that red is their best. So there's different eye receptors for different um, pollinators and what they're seeing in the latest, if I can go back to a flower, maybe the orange butterfly weed is a good choice for that one. So a lot of them actually are not seeing color. What they're seeing is arrows. So what they've been testing for in insects is these little stripes here, and maybe I can pick another flower that shows it better, are like targets for the pollinators. And they're almost seeing with like infrared vision. So imagine all the colors are white for this. This is black and white. And you have a little arrow telling you, this is where the nectar is. This is where the nectar is. Okay, so let's see if we can find kind of a little bit more on the Coreopsis and Black-Eyed Susan. You have some of those streak indicators for the dark center. 
Um, same thing with the cone flower. And I think in the second part, we'll get to some more of those. Um, but the latest studies on insects and pollinators also show that you want to have a mass of the same type of flower. So say a three foot by three foot section, and then another three foot by three foot section somewhere else in your garden. So I would have a big clump of black eyed Susans, say at the front of one bed, and then I'll have cone flowers and other things mixed in here, and maybe some milkweed, and then another mass of black eyed Susan um, in another area. So what they're doing when they're flying over and they're looking for nectar sources is they're looking for large groups together. So not just one Z, two Z, one in a container here, one over there. It has to be worth their while to make a stop and gather a bunch at once as the flowers are opening at once. Um, so that's really key. And I'm glad you asked that question that you should be planting in groupings, um, kind of like a swath. It doesn't have to be a perfect circle. It doesn't have to be a square or any shape like that. But just try to think in terms of several plants of one kind and then several plants of another kind and several plants of another kind. Um, so think of some of the meadow plantings where you have a colony of one plant kind of streaking through another colony of another plant. That's the patterns that are natural for pollinators that they're looking for. Okay, so um, David asks, what is the minimum amount of light in New York asters and Stokes asters require if the goal is to just feed the pollinators or is it important to know if it's a straight or not? And yeah, I'm going to talk about asters in the fall fall blooming uh, nectar plants in a minute, but minimum amount of light is probably four to six hours of sun to get decent flowering. Anything less than that and you're going to get very sporadic flowers. So if you're wanting to attract pollinators for a nectar source, of course, uh, they need uh, more sun for more flowers. So the more you can give it there. Okay, I think we hit everything and I don't think I see anything in the text coming through, so that's great. All right, so we'll dive into the second half and maybe answer a little bit more for David about asters. Okay, so we're rounding the corner to midsummer now and Monarda fistulosa, the wild bergamot, is one of my personal favorites for my pollinator garden because it does form a nice colony and it's got these nice little arrows here telling the bumblebees right here, right here is where our pollen is and you see right there where it's coming out there. So this one is a favorite of hummingbird moss and so it's different from hummingbirds. Hummingbird moss um, are so dramatic and fun to watch in the garden. So if you'd like to attract hummingbird moss, this is a, a great choice for your garden. And also attracts a few other more rare bees. And that includes the black bees and the cuckoo bees. So look out for those in your Monarda patch. Okay, so the other Monarda that I just in love with is the spotted bee balm. And this one is beneficial to many types of bees and butterflies. But what I love is it has the stacks of flowers upon flowers upon flowers. It looks like crowns. And then it's got like a spotted type of tongue here. And that's your guiding right there to your nectar, nectaries telling the bees. They're not really seeing this pinky purple. They're just seeing the streaks that are on these flowers. So this is a really good example of telling you, hey, come inside, come inside and pollinate me. I really want you to have my nectar. So then you'll go to another one of my flowers and you'll pollinate me with a, one of my sister plants or brother plants. All right, so next is the Virginia Mountain Mint, Pyracanthum virginium. And this one, if you want bees <laughs> to your garden. So I said there was a top three and coneflower, mountain mint would be my number two. So full sun can take almost all soil conditions, doesn't really need any maintenance except for a good chop back at the end of wintertime into spring uh, so the new growth can emerge. Has When you crush the leaves, it has that beautiful minty smell. It's got a bit of this like white chalkiness to the flower. It's not the most dramatic or like... Uh, I guess, beautiful flower for cut flowers, but it's a great addition to your pollinator garden and it quickly forms a big clump. So just like our herbal mint that can take off and take over a garden, 
beware that Virginia mountain mint is a fast spreader too. Um, so this is one that's loved by many types of beetles and wasps and bees, but especially I see tons of honeybees um, and the pearl crescent butterflies on the Virginia mountain mint. All right, so let's go on to Lobelia syphilitica, which is the great blue Lobelia. So there's a white version of it as well. Um, and it's still called blue Lobelia, but it's blue Lobelia alba. So you'll see on the label, it'll say Lobelia syphilitica, then I'll say alba. So it looks just the same, but it's that. So beneficial for bumblebees. I have seen also, um, funnily enough, hummingbirds on my great blue Lobelia. And this is one of the native pollinator nectar sources that I grow in part shade. Um, so you see it here, my gazebo is shading it and I have a big oak tree right here. So it's one that I would consider a more of a woodland shade type pollinator nectar source. Um, for those of us with um, more shady than sunny gardens, this is a great choice for you. Um, it reseeds itself about but it doesn't form big colonies or anything. You just have like sporadic little reseeding about. So you might need to buy new plants every few years to um, add to your plantings in your garden. All right, Oop, I think I just clicked off of that. Ah, so our native Chelonia glabra, that's the white turtle head. Um, and that one's beneficial to our Baltimore checker spot. Can't get more Maryland than that, right? Uh, we got our terrapins and we got our Baltimore checker spot. So, and the hummingbirds love it as well. So it's got its name because it uh, looks like a little turtle head and it opens up right there for the Baltimore checker spot to access. Uh, there is a cultivar version that's pink. That one um, is beautiful in the garden. It's a beautiful garden plant. It's not as beneficial. The Baltimore checker spot doesn't seem to gravitate to it. Other bees and things will go to it, other pollinators, but if you're particularly looking to support the Baltimore checker spot, spot then you want the white version. So I have it side by side um, with my Black Eyed Susans and it forms a small colony. It's slow to expand. It's not one of those natives that's an aggressive spreader. Um, so good choice for like a part sun to sun position um, in your perennial border. All right, so cup plant, Silphium perfoliatum, if I can uh, get my Latin out there. So this one is, I told you I'd give you a top three. This is number three. And this one, Dr. Paula Shrewsbury, an entomologist at University of Maryland said, it is the best native pollinator plant for the state of Maryland, bar none. So it is always covered with different types of native bees in my garden. And you can see here is right next to, I live next to a state highway. I've got it out in the median strip, separated from the rest of my garden because I'm letting it take over the median strip because cup plant, cup plant is a monster. <laughs> it grows really wide and tall. So picture a sunflower, but instead of one giant sunflower at the top of a mammoth sunflower, you got lots of little sunflower type um, flowers at the top. And the trick to do it is to make sure once it stops flowering for the season um, in early fall that you cut off those seed heads before it seeds everywhere else in your garden because cup plant is a very aggressive spreader by seed. Um, it also forms by clump and colony. So where you plant it is where it's going to stay forever. So be very um, careful of the site you select for it. So that's why I've selected the median strip where I know it's penned in by traffic and the sidewalk and I can keep a close eye on it. Still highly visited, even though I have tons of traffic going by and tons of people on the sidewalk near it, that doesn't dissuade the pollinators because it's above their heads. Um, most people's heads is about eight feet tall flower. So I had to get up on a little step ladder to take this picture right here. And this one, I think I'm also on the step ladder kind of trying to look down into it. And the way it gets its name is cup plant is the leaves come out from the stem here in the bottom right, you'll see, and it holds water in this little vase right there. And sometimes after a rainstorm, you'll go and you'll see that the water is a little um, 
drinking source for our native bees and butterflies as well. They'll come and they'll walk down the leaf and they'll sip out of that water that's being held in the cup plant. So this is a great addition to your garden in um, late summer, fall, when we usually have a drought period, right? Usually end of July into August, we might have some passing storms, but we can have some weeks of drought in there. So this is a great um, addition to have to your garden. And that's also a good place to stop and note that pollinators need water. Um, they need drinking water, fresh drinking water, just like mammals do. Uh, so most of our pollinator insects are looking for a shallow place that's safe for them to drink. So you can create a little butterfly ponding area by having like a shallow saucer that you half bury in the ground and putting rocks in there and then pouring fresh water every once in a while. Of course, you don't want mosquitoes to breed in that. So you wanna dump out the saucer every couple of days to make sure mosquitoes aren't laying eggs and breeding in, in that water. And you wanna keep the, the water pretty fresh. Um, I also find having some side sources. I have a water garden and a rain barrel that I will put like a twig and some rocks on the side of, just tiny little twigs and rocks that bees can land on and be safe um, and drink from. And it's so fun to watch on my rain barrel, the edge of the rain barrel while I have little twigs across that the honeybees will actually line up and take their turn <laughs> drinking from the edge of my rain barrel and my watering cans if you give them a little place to land there. Um, so super important to have a water source, uh, especially for our pollinators and um, not just uh, you know some giant urn or something, you have to have something where they feel safe and can land on and be away from predators. Okay, so we talked a little bit earlier about the straight species Joe Pye weed, and this is how it looks growing in the wild, and you can see it gets really big and rangy and kind of floppy. So if you have the space and you have a wet sunny spot in your garden and a place maybe at the back of a border next to a fence that it can lean on, that would be perfect. Um, honeybees and most all bees and skippers of moss love the nectar from Joe Pye weed and that's a late summer early fall blooming plant and like I said the little Joe and some of the new cultivars are just being bred to be shorter versions and the flowers should be just as um, welcoming for the pollinators. I haven't seen any studies showing um, the cultivars of Joe Pye weed that are bred to be shorter um, have any fewer pollinators visiting them. Okay, so now we have our local Solidaga, the early goldenrod, and that's beloved by many insects, but also by our um, goldfinches that love to come and they love to like pull off the little single blossoms and munch on them, I see. And I don't know if they're eating tiny insects as well, but I do see tons of goldfinches on my goldenrod. So goldenrod is similar to Tradescantia uh, that we talked about earlier, the Ohio spiderwort that likes to seed itself around. So if you don't wanna leave the seed heads up for the birds in the winter time and risk a bit of reseeding in different spots in your garden, then you wanna cut that back um, before the seeds start to form because uh, goldenrod is a prolific reseeder but again, I find that not to be such a big issue because I can dig the clump and move it somewhere else if I see it popping up in a part of my garden that I don't want it to be in. All right, so then we have the New York ironweed, uh, Vernonia novobarinensis, if I can also pronounce that Latin name. So this one is beneficial to many, many varieties of butterflies and native bees, similar to Joe Pye weed and looks and size but it tends to stay more upright and not flop over. And here I have it um, in a city garden among skyscrapers being uh, visited by a monarch butterfly here. Um, there are shorter versions, uh, cultivars of New York ironweed as well, if this is something that's a little too big for your garden. Uh, but I find the straight native species of New York ironweed um, pretty easy to grow in a garden at the back of a border where they can be supported by other perennials. All right, and then it was, I think, David who asked about the asters. So there are hundreds of types of native asters from white wood asters 
uh, to some, ast some asters that bloom in spring and summer, but asters really come into their own in autumn and why they are essential for your garden. And I would say, I gave you a top three, I would put this as three plus to add asters to your garden is because they lengthen the season that nectar is available for our pollinators. So just when everything else is starting to go down in our garden and stop blooming and start um, getting prepared for the cold and winter season, that's when asters are just starting to bloom and come on. Um, so it gives us another at least good month to six weeks of blooms to support any pollinators that are still in our gardens uh, and to get them over that little hump, so to say, uh, in mid to late fall. So you can see that tons of our pollinators are supported by asters and they come in different versions from super tall Tartarian aster to the short woody types. Um, they do seed about a little bit or form little clumps, but I find that again, they're pretty easy to dig and move and you can have asters in containers, you can have asters in your border, um, but asters, you should have several different varieties around your garden. Um, and again, to lengthen the season for our pollinators. All right, so one of the last things to bloom in my garden in the fall is boneset or eupatorium. And this one is, an, again, a late blooming one. So it gets that late blooming burst of nectar just before the butterflies and bees are going to migrate or hibernate. Um, so it is just looks like a little cluster of white flowers at the top of a tall green stem. This one is one that is a prolific reseeder as well. So you can snip off the seed heads before they form. Again, pretty easy to dig and move, um, but it's one that kind of blends in with the rest of the garden for the rest of the year. It's not a showy flower. It's kind of one of those backbone flowers that you'll see pop up every once in a while throughout your garden. So it's not one that I mind um, if it reseeds about a little bit. Okay, so quickly on winter tips, um, we talked about keeping our echinacea seed heads up um, for bird seeds to provide. So this is my corner and you'll see on the other side of this fence where the cup plant is, this is my patch of echinacea next to my pond. So I'm not only keeping the seed heads up for birds, but I'm also keeping these stems up because this is where our native beetles and bees hibernate for the winter time. So basically they're kind of at the 18 inch point down and they cut a slit in the hollow stems of our native perennials and they tuck themselves into that stem and that's where they winter over. So they kind of just like curl themselves up in any type of hollow stem. So think about all those hollow stem perennials we just talked about. So everything from New York ironweed to Joe Pye weed to Black Eyed Susan, if you cut off the seed heads, just cut off like the top four to six inches if you don't want it to reseed about, but leave the stems up so that they can winter over in the stems. And then once it's next spring and the day temperatures are consistently above 50 to 55 degrees, then cut back the stems and make a, like a little pile to the side to let those pollinators emerge from there. Because what happens is if you clean out everything in the fall and chop off all this foliage and send it out with your yard waste, you're also sending out all our native bees and pollinators and beetles to go out with the landscape waste or yard waste um, to, you know, wherever it goes to a pile and they will be chopped up. And unfortunately, you're sending away your native friends. <laughs> so keep those up as long as you can stand it in the garden. If you are really a neat, neat gardener and don't like the look of stray stems sticking up, I personally love the look of, of these seed heads. But if you don't like that look, go ahead and cut them off. And again, make a pile to the side and just stack that up and leave that over the winter time um, on the side, uh, maybe behind a shed or something where you don't have to look at it all the time. And then clean that out once it, the uh, springtime temperatures are um, warm enough for them to emerge. And we did talk a little bit about providing a water source in the wintertime as well. 
um, with my water garden, I just make sure to have at least a little gap in the ice if it ever freezes over totally. What uh, little trick I use is to have a water bottle with salt water inside the sealed water bottle floating in there. And that keeps a little bit of ice open around the floating uh, salt water bottle, um, just enough for the pollinators and the birds to access in the wintertime if we ever get a really uh, heavy couple of days of freezing temperatures in our region. All right, so further reading and sources on supporting our native pollinators. Um, in every issue of Washington Gardener, we um, talk about, a, do a plant profile on native plants. And even this tropical cover is one of my favorite native plants. And we talked about this um, in the talk a few weeks ago. So you get bonus points if you can name this native flower that looks like a crazy tropical, but actually is in our region. Um, so go on garden tours, check out what your neighbors are growing, look at what pollinators are attracted to their garden. Um, obviously, if you spray chemicals to get rid of mosquitoes and other bugs, that's going to also impact our pollinators. So um, try to be chemical free in your gardens as much as possible. Check out the local public gardens. Adkins Arboretum on the Eastern Shore is a wonderful native garden in our region to visit for great um, inspiration and to see what's in their, their uh, collections. And they have a wonderful native plant sale as well. You can go on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter and follow other um, native and pollinator plant enthusiasts. And I talked about Doug Tallamy's other book with Rick Dark at the beginning, uh, but he has two books that specifically talk about supporting caterpillar larva. Uh, it's mainly because he is an entomologist, not a horticulturalist. And so bringing nature home makes the case for it. And nature's best hope tells you how. Um, so if you're more interested in a prescription of what can I plant in my garden and how much he gives a couple of different theories and formulas in Nature's Best Hope. And I think that's the more accessible book for the home gardener um, to grab and read that book for ideas for supporting pollinators in their garden. And I wanted to point out that um, Homestead Gardens has an Instagram page called Native Habitat Center. So at Native Habitat Center and a Facebook group called the Native Habitat Group. So right there, Native Habitat Group, where Heather Wheatley is posting hints and tips for supporting native habitats, um, a lot of our pollinators and plants that we can use in our gardens. Okay, so that was a lot <laughs> that I threw out you. And we have about five minutes left for questions, but I was going to say go ahead and pop any uh, favorite native perennial plants, maybe even a few trees or shrubs that I might have missed in this uh, big grouping of plants I just threw at you. And I think I saw a few more in the Q&A. So I'll start, whoop, that was my alarm. A few things in the Q&A. So Ron asks, how can you extend, extend the duration of Monarda flowering? So um, you can do what's called the Chelsea chop, which is a cut back in June, uh, maybe late May, early June cut it back and then it will flower later in the season. So you can use that trick to cut back just part of your Monarda. Say you have a good swath of like a four foot by two foot swath of Monarda in your garden. You could do half of that cut back um, in late spring and leave the other half to do earlier. The other way you can um, have longer Monarda flowering is by picking different varieties of Monarda. So you can look in plant catalogs and uh, at Homestead Gardens for early, mid, and late blooming season Monardas. Um, but I think the cutback is probably the best trick you can do for the garden um, is to cut it back and then let some of it, some of it, not all of it, be late flowering for you. All right, so let's go back to the chat section. Uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. I'm scrolling back to David. Okay, my users, users were attacked by tiny bugs last year, lace bugs, and I haven't found a good way to fight them. Help from Arthur. Asters, not users. <laughs> okay, so your asters were attacked by tiny bugs, and you think they might be lace bugs. Could have been little thrips or things. So um, if that happens again this year, you might take a picture and post it to that Homestead Native Habitat Garden page and we'll try to get a diagnosis for you. 
Um, if their little thrips or little white bugs are attacking them, you could spray it down with a hose. If it's tiny larval caterpillars, then you want that. <laughs> so not all bugs are bad. And sometimes the larval stage of a bug will look alarming. And you're like, what is that bug? And you can look it up online, maybe post a picture on the, the Facebook page for Homestead, and we'll try to get an ID for you. And we can let you know, is that a beneficial bug or is that something that's gonna be eating up your asters and depriving your pollinators of those? Okay, so Jean says, planted several milkweeds last year in late summer. They were inundated by aphids. Uh, this year, nothing seems to be coming at all in Central Virginia. Advice, please. Okay, so milkweeds, um, they, there's a milkweed bug that does attack them in aphids. Again, a strong spray of a hose can knock that off. And sometimes it's the year. Sometimes it goes season by season. Some years we have hotter, drier summers. Sometimes we have long, wet, cool summers. And last summer, we had a lot, a lot of rain, a lot of moisture in the air, a lot of humidity, and a lot of heat. And so that was a good combination for aphids. Um, what you can do is try to attract and leave some of those aphids up because you will start to attract other beneficial bugs and birds to eat those aphids off the plant. But if none of your milkweeds are coming up this year, um, you might try um, to purchase some new plants and start from scratch in maybe a different spot in your garden. Okay, Jean says, me too, Kathy, we'll answer a minute. Uh, what about hummingbird feed? Is it bad to feed pollinators these drinks? Yeah, there's um, some controversy on bird feeding in general. So some people say it's bad for birds, it makes them lazy, it gets them in a habit of, of being... Um, uh, dependent on humans and then other people are like we need to provide this extra seed or this extra sugar water to get them over the hump because we have deprived them of many of their nectar sources or food sources. So again a little bit of controversy there. Uh, I think a little bit of the sugar water for hummingbirds is fine as long as you're keeping it sanitary and it's getting cleaned out. So um, no diseases are carried over. Same thing with a bird bath or a bird feeder. You want to make sure it's clean. You can like dump it out, wipe it down with a 10% bleach solution, and then refill it with new seeds or, or new um, nectar water as you like. But definitely make sure that it's not transferring diseases from one bird to another. Um, that would be the worst case scenario for feeding birds in your garden. I tend to not do either of those. I tend to just let the seed head stay up on my plants and provide that food source for birds and try to just have as many nectar sources as possible for birds in my garden. Okay, so what about moss? You haven't mentioned moss. So I did mention the hummingbird moth and a few of the other moth varieties and I can go really back quickly through some of the um, top 20 ones that are beneficial to moss in our list here. And so the goldenrod is a particular one that moss love um, and as well as Joe pie weed. Cup plant, so I've seen a few moss at night. I have a really um, well lit corner because it's an urban situation here. So there's never a time where it's just dead dark at night that I have too many moss, but I do see some moss coming to that. Um, and I was going to go back to do, 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 the um, wild bergamot was the one in particular that we said hummingbird moss liked, but also not that one. We're going to go back to um, Zizia. I've seen a couple moss, but not a ton. And also the creeping flocks. I will see the day flying sphinx moss, the hummingbird moth, and the clear wing moth. This one I see a lot more moss on. And the funny thing is I see more moss in my vegetable garden uh, because of growing herbs like dill and brassicas like broccoli and letting the broccoli um, bolt and flower than I do in my pollinator gardens. So I would suggest uh, that's even a better source for supporting moth larvae is to let your brassica plants go to flower and set seed 
and then letting the moths um, put their eggs on them and pollinate those and letting them hatch and the larval caterpillars of the moss can eat down the, the brassicas at that point in the season when you're no longer harvesting your broccoli, your cabbage, or your kale from the plants and they've bolted due to the heat. So that's a, that's a great thing to do in your vegetable garden. Okay, um, do you need to plant white for moss or is that a myth, night, night moss? So there are moss that are particularly um, uh, gravitate toward white or bright things and that's why they like the light uh, and will go towards that but white flowers are not necessary so they'll go for as you see the the flocks and some of the other color flowers not just and I'm going to scroll back to where we were not just white flowers but bright flowers and that's another great topic for a talk another time would be moon gardens and night gardens so a lot of people plant gardens with all white flowers or bright color flowers so they can enjoy them in the early evening after they've been away at work all day and come back home so that's kind of a, a thing that's gone away during covid but it'll probably come back um, as a trend in the next few years and really quick since we're winding up here I wanted to give my contact information for follow-up questions so of course you can still keep posting questions to the Homestead Gardens page on Facebook um, you can also find me at social media at WDC Gardener at Twitter Instagram and Pinterest um, my blog and website is washingtongardener.blogspot.com on Facebook is Washington Gardener Magazine and I have a podcast uh, called Garden DC and one of our podcast episodes last summer was with the uh, Smithsonian Gardens folk. And we talked a lot about supporting monarchs and pollinators in our region. So that might be a great episode to listen to if you're really interested in more information on supporting our local pollinators. And if you enjoyed today's talk, I'd love a review at greatgardenspeakers.com. And I'm going to go back to uh, leave that information up because I think I saw another couple of questions. Oh, Betsy says, in the past years, I've had lots of hummingbird moss in my butterfly bush. Butterfly bush was, wasn't mentioned in your talk. How do you feel about these? So butterfly bush, Budlia, is not native to our region. It is uh, sometimes referred to as junk food for pollinators uh, because it's you got a, a high amount of sugar so they'll come and they'll feast all over it so it's kind of like giving um insects or pollinators uh maybe an ice cream treat you can you can think of it that way or a candy bar so it's not going to do any real harm and it does attract them to your garden but i wouldn't have it as the only thing in my garden so if you just had one butterfly bush and it didn't reseed or spread elsewhere. That's totally fine. There's new sterile versions of the butterfly bush that you can buy, mini sterils um, that you can grow in a container and still enjoy having pollinators visit the butterfly bush, but then have adjacent to that milkweeds, coneflowers, rudbeckia, other things that give them more substantial nutrients, um, so to speak. So you wouldn't eat just junk food 24-7. Although that would be the dream, right? <laughs> but we would not be in great shape if we did that. So you wanna provide other sources for them as well. And then what to plant near the butterfly bush and the big clumps you mentioned. So again, butterfly bush likes full sun and you could do um, Joe pie weed right next to it in the back of a butterfly bush and that could support um, the Joe pie weed as it gets taller. Then in the front, you could do a border, a mixed border of the Black Eyed Susan, the Coneflower, and Liatris would look great together. Um, and in the springtime, maybe have a little border of that creeping flocks right at the very, very front of that border. So that would be a nice combination to carry you over. And then, of course, if you could work in some asters in there, that would get you even through late fall as well. Right, I think we're caught up on all the questions in the chat and checking to make sure. Let's see if we got any more texts coming over. Okay, I think we got all those too. So I want to thank everybody so much for joining me this evening and talking all about pollinators and how to attract them with our native plants to our gardens. I also want to thank Homestead Gardens for hosting this. And again, I will be checking on the Homestead Gardens page under this thread 
uh, for any additional questions as they pop up. Um, so if they occur to you later on, feel free to pop those into the chat and just making sure I didn't miss anything in the Q&A again. Okay, I think we got that all. So thank you so much, everyone. Have wonderful springtime and summer. Happy gardening. And we're going to do another talk coming up on tomato growing. Um, great tomato selections for our area in a few weeks. So be sure to go to Homestead Gardens events page and sign up for that. And then on the first Wednesday of June, we'll be back here talking about um, plant combinations and great classic ways to make our garden combinations look great. All right, thank you all. Thank you so much, Kathy.